Superman used to be a mutation until he was able to catalyze his abilities and turn it into unique strength. Today we are proposing a system that will make children fly. Two things in my speech. Firstly, framing and secondly, use of STEM. So first thing is my framing. What school system should we judge it We say that first of all, it should be accessible and thus fair. And secondly, we say that it should be most efficient in providing the best possible education. Secondly, a model of how this school system could look like. We say that first of all, the voucher is used for, uh, to pay for tuition fees of private and public schools. Secondly, this is given to a percentage of the society below the median wealth. This percentage depends on the socioeconomic background of the country. Thirdly, we say that these schools are principally funded by school vouchers. However, if small schools with significant social relevance, such as schools for blind students, we support the government subsidies to further finance these schools. Fourthly, we say that private schools may not charge higher tuition fees than the school vouchers. And <coughs> fifthly, we say that this school voucher includes the possibility right. to leave the region if necessary. Before that, yes. When, when you tell that there should be some more subsidies for the government, do you not concede that there should be some state regulation in those schools? No, we say that these schools are then able to put more money into these schools to further finance them because we think that these schools are so important on our side of the house. So the sixth point of framing that we have are restrictions for, pri for private schools. We say that they first of all should not discriminate based on ethnicities. Secondly, there should be a limit of the teacher's salary in relation to the public schools. And thirdly, the schools should have an o uh, the government should have an oversight of what the institutions do because, for, uh, for example, through requirements of fulfilling the standardized tests. So having clarified this, what will we do in this debate? Firstly, in my speech, I'll have a look at how we create more equal opportunities, and our second speaker will have a look at the increase uh, of the quality of education. So into my substantive speech of how we create more equal opportunities by solving the two main problems that we identify in the status quo. So the first problem that we see is inequality. So we see that there is generally an inequality between public and private schools, right? We say that, for example, the people who come from higher income classes used to, uh, tend to attend private schools more. And those who come from lower income classes attend private schools. So according to The Guardian, the UK has a double, a double the amount of privately educated students come from a middle or upper class background. Thus, we also see the additional characterization that private schools cater the needs and have the culture of uni access, and public schools are flooded and unable to handle situations. We say that this is especially relevant in developing countries, where the income disparities are most disruptive and the government's educational system is not regulated well. So why do we think that this inequality is unfair? Two reasons. Firstly, arbitrariness of birth. We say that due to arbitrary factors of birth, you have different starting points for your education and thus different chances. Second thing why we think it's unfair is the right to proper education. We say that this is a prerequisite for self-determination because we believe that we need a certain amount of knowledge and the ability of critical thinking, which is taught in schools, in order to base our decisions upon. Thus, in order for the right to education to be best fulfilled, we believe that we have to ensure the best possible, expel, uh, best possible accessibility. So then, thus we see a perpetuation of inequalities through this unfairness. So we see that there are incredibly intelligent and bright young minds that have robbed their potential because yeah. the current system excludes them financially because they do, and because it does not offer a diverse educational system. So we see the perpetuation of inequalities, firstly on a socioeconomic basis, unproportionately affecting the ones who are already disenfranchised. We say that if you go to a school in your area of living, you're primarily surrounded by the people with the same socioeconomic background. Thus, they have the feeling of not being able to escape their situation because they're primarily surrounded by people of the same group. Second way we see the perpetuation of inequalities is through the ethnic basis. We see that similar that there's a similar mechanism that the people stay in their groups, and thus these groups are isolated from each other, and thus the society is more divided. So secondly, the problem that we see is that people are exclu excluded from the education as it's not diverse enough. So what we see in the status quo is that people have special needs, right? Such as different learning abilities, such as being more talented in one area. So we see that everyone has one specific, uh, has some kind of special needs. And only a minority of the students actually meets the norms of these public schools. Because we believe that these public schools are simply a melting pot for needs, right? The government has to, has to provide for the general public. Thus, it only uh, creates a generalized approach, which, does, which doesn't suit all. Thus, we see that people fall through the cracks. So what would change under a school voucher system? We say that we give people a choice. We say that this is principally good. Why is this the case? Because we give a higher legitimacy of the decision making. We say that the par parents are then able to make the decision that suits their children best. We say that the parents are the best actors to do this because they're closest to their children and know what they know best. 
And secondly, we say that this is principally good because it hires the legitimacy of money usage. So currently we see that private schools are often to a certain extent publicly funded, such as in the Slo uh, Slovak Republic or in Hong Kong. It is up to 90% publicly funded. Thus, we think it is most legitimate that these schools use the money coming from the public to make these schools more open to the public instead of only to those who pay privately. Secondly, we say that the school voucher system improves it on a practical layer. We say that the children uh, and their parents have a choice, irrespective of their socioeconomic background, right? But to give the people the chance to escape their social background and become more integrated and accepted within the general society. So we say that even if they do not take this opportunity, the option in itself gives, this, gives the children a psychological advancement. Because they have the option to escape their current situation, no thank you, and because this makes their current status more vo uh, voluntary. So secondly, we say that this is practically good because we see that there's a possibility of upward social mobility. We say that people work harder because they have a hope of advancement and, they have, uh, and they're better striving for a better career because they already go to a school which is perceived as better, because they're supported and pushed to their potential and because the culture of going to uni at private schools is already generally higher than at public schools. <coughs> the third reason why we think that this is practically good under a school voucher system is because we say that it deconstructs racism because children who usually do not care about the origin of their classmates but are put together in one class and learn to accept and ex respect each other. So secondly, we say that we make education more diverse under a school voucher system. We say that private schools are specialized for more specific needs, right? Private schools are better to cater the needs of the children. For example, if some students are good at sciences but not as good at language, we on our side of the house have, a, have the option for the students to be at a school which focuses more on sciences, which focuses more on the specific uh, ways of learning of how we can do these sciences. Or for example, if a person is not able to sit down for <coughs> last six hours straight to concentrate on one specific topic. We say that on our side of the house, we have schools that will have a look at this and will try to benefit the students in a way that best impacts them. So what we see are the impacts of this, is that the students have a higher motivation and thus have better achievements. Because if you go to a school system which suits you better, you have more of an incentive to work harder and thus achieve more and fulfill your own potential. Thus, we see, an, we see an empowerment of the poor and disenfranchised people. Second impact we see is that we create more happiness, right? In public schools, people who have quirks or special needs are told to suppress them. For example, if someone is, um, learns with visual learning, it is told to suppress this and uh, meet the norms of the general society. Thus, it gives the children the feeling that something is wrong with them, and this leads to them feeling excluded and less confident. Now, in private schools, he ha the child has a chance to study in a way that suits that child best without feeling like an outsider. And because we want children to feel uh, not to feel like outsiders, but rather like superheroes who have to learn to use their abilities and be accepted, I've never been so proud to propose this. Question. The average school voucher in Arizona gets you around $4,000. But the cheapest private school in Arizona costs more than $10,000. But moreover, those same schools in Arizona which are <coughs> private and take vouchers do not have to abide to the same principles and rules of the curriculum and do not have to administer their kids to the same tests. At the point at which Team Germany does not only compromise the accessibility that people do not get on their side of the house, but also compromises quality, we are more than proud to stay the opposition on Team Croatia. What is our stance in this debate? We tell that we would never use states and taxpayers' money to found private schools and their private owners and private investors. Rather, we would invest that money into the public educational system. What do we believe is the metric by which you should judge this debate? We believe that there are three questions here. First of all, who gets more accessible education? Secondly, who gets better quality of education? And lastly, who justifies the spending of public money? These are exactly going to be our three substantive points under the opposition. But before going on into my two constructive points, the first about accessibility and the second about quality, firstly, some refutation. Uh, about their model, when they tell you that only the ones who are below the, the middle wealth are going to get it. They then concede that not everyone is going to get a school voucher, meaning that you sure cannot get equality if only the, about the 10% of the society get those vouchers. But secondly, when they, 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 when they tell you that those vouchers are going to be state regulated, they essentially concede that there needs to be some state regulation like the curriculums. What is extremely problematic on Team Germany is that you cannot control these private schools since they're essentially private entities and, and the state cannot 
not intervene into those private companies because they are profit-driven private companies. Now, firstly, when we talk about Sir. equality, three answers here. First of all is that you only get an extremely small amount of people into, into those schools, like we see in the example of Arizona, where people literally need to cash out double the amount of the voucher only to get their kids in schools. This is extremely problematic at the point when those people who need to cash this money out are the people of the lowest incomes. But moreover, we tell you that the biggest group in the society, the middle class, is never going to get vouchers under the Team Germany side, meaning that you leave the whole middle class who essentially do not go to private schools as they concede on their side of the house, leaving with no schools. But moreover, they do not show you, never literally show you how everyone gets a voucher. Secondly, when they talk about some sort of integration and some sort of um, racism, uh, stuff like that, we tell you that this is the problem, is that the, there is structural racism in the society. If you have racist people who essentially um, made, made up these schools, this doesn't change if the school is private. If someone is racist, it doesn't mean that he was not going to be racist if he works in a private school. Moreover, we tell you that they never show you how they essentially solve this. They never show you the impact, how do they solve this. But moreover, we tell you that people in ghettos are still going to go to private schools in ghettos, which is again problematic because you again have racism on their side of the house. And lastly, when they talk about the developing countries, we tell you this is extremely problematic in the developing countries because those private companies who get into developing countries exploit those countries, exploit that people. Look at the example of Pakistan, where every year, uh, where every year, uh, the, the the money you need to put into the private school to go into private school essentially rises by 20 percent, while you still get the same voucher, but you need to cash out more and more money, and you are the lowest income person in the society. Now, secondly, when you talk about some sort of public money and some sort of choice. First of all, we tell you that people can still go to various public schools. They, are, they, they can choose high schools uh, upon their priorities they want, to, the, 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 they, they want to succeed in life. But we tell you that even if people cannot choose a school, we tell you that on our side of the house, what we are going to prove and clash with this substantive is that everyone gets the same in the public school, which is going to be of extreme high quality under the side of the opposition. No, thank you. But again, notice how side proposition here doesn't prove anything. They never show you the comparative why public schools are much worse, but moreover, we tell you that People cannot go to these schools because not everyone has the same money. When, but but when, and the, at the end of their speech, when they talk about disabled kids, Mr. Speaker, in Georgia, it costs about $25,000 to get a disabled kid in school, and the voucher is around $5,000. It is comparatively even worse on side of the proposition for those disabled kids, and we tell you that they never show you how they are going to make them essentially Sorry. help those people with disabled kids. We tell you that under a public educational system, we include absolutely everyone. We are more than happy to have professors for disabled kids, but at the end of the day, they never even give you any proof of quality of these schools. Never have they ever mentioned the word quality under their side of the house. Our first substantive point, we tell you that we do not support the school voucher system because it does not ensure accessibility of education to every single student. First question, Gaspar says, why is it so important that education is accessible? We tell you that no matter how rich your parents are and what your background is, you, you can get good opportunities based on your hard work and abilities with an accessible educational system. Therefore, we finally remove this arbitrary factor of birth. This is literally the most important thing in this debate. The most important metric sure. is accessibility. No, thank you. But why do we think that it is the role of the state to ensure this accessibility? We tell you the role of the state is to protect its citizens and utilize their taxpayers' money in a way that is going to benefit the most people. In this debate, this is the side which gets the most people in schools. This is the side which is going to ensure the most accessibility. So let's get into a comparative, which Germany never does. Let's get into comparative. How does public make it more accessible. We tell you that uh, than vouchers. We have two problems with vouchers. First is, I have already stated that not everyone gets a voucher. We will look at examples of some more examples, like Indiana, where they have invested more than $146 million into the voucher system, but less than 3% of their kids go to a voucher program. Program. This is extremely problematic. We tell you that on our side of the house, let's show you the comparative. By directing this money to the public education, we can ensure the same quality Sir. of education to and equal opportunities, essentially, to everyone. But even more problematic is that vouchers, in most cases, are not enough. In practice, voucher programs can only cover a fraction of the cost of tuition, and even with them, a huge number of people cannot afford education for their kids. As I have stated in Georgia, it costs about $5,000 a school voucher, but what you need to cash out is more than $10,000. Not everyone can do this. Education is not accessible, sorry. but most importantly, is not accessible. Well, take you in a moment, sorry, but it's not accessible to those lowest income families. Yes. Do you believe that in the status quo, often public schools are 
giving their children less good education than private. You know why do those pri pri uh, public schools in edu in the educational system are bad in the status quo? Because those countries have vouchers. When we direct all the money from vouchers to the public system, we get a public a better public system. So we tell that instead of vouchers, it is, it is better to invest even more in the public system, which is more accessible to everyone. We take this metric. Secondly, our second substantive point about regulation and quality. Firstly, let's look at how there is no regulation in private schools. We tell that these private schools are essentially private companies. They have boards of private schools which make all the decisions. They decide the whole curriculum, they decide the teaching methods, and they literally choose the teachers by any criteria they see fit. And the state cannot regulate them because they are essentially private entities and private companies. Notice at the example of the US, where some schools literally send their children Google links, Google links instead of giving them textbooks from the curriculum because they simply can do whatever they want under their side of the house. But often these schools also sacrifice resources and infrastructure in order to save more money for them, which usually means that they spend money on flashy marketing and expensive public relations in order to attract more people. In the US, those private schools spend 27% of their funding just for marketing and public relations. But also notice that those schools are incredibly financially unstable since they can do whatever they want. We see that since 2008, more than 119 charter schools have closed. 14 of those charter schools never finish their first, second year, leaving those children without any education. But let's look at the final comparative which saves everyone in the society, the public education. We tell you that here the state brings expertise and ensure facilities, materials and high quality curriculums because of the rules they have to abide to, like we see in Finland, which has the greatest and the best public educational system in the world because of the investment of all the money for education into public education and constantly updating the curriculum. So because we ensure accessibility for every single student and we ensure a quality educational system for every single student for the opposition. Today on Side Proposition, we vouch for a better future, not only for the students, but also for society. Now in my kind of speech, I'm going to do three things. First of all, reconstruct our first speaker's arguments. Second of all, negate their arguments. And third of all, come to my stance about the increase in quality of education due to competition. Now first of all, let's take a look at what they answered to our points. Now before I come to this, let's first of all clarify a few points. Now, the, in their POI to our first speaker, they said that there's no regulations, right? That the private institutions basically get to do what they want to do. Now, we said that we still have a certain basic curriculum, right? We still have a certain basic idea of knowledge that we want to give to these students, and that this regulation still exists in that sense, but we still have a certain free regulation, like we have no regulations, on the sense of how these students are now going to teach, right? We have no regulations on whether the students are allowed to like stand up while they're being teached, or sit down while they're being teached. We have no regulations on how these students are actually going to learn stuff, but more as on what in the end should come out. And we believe that the state, these regulations exist because the state actually gives them money, meaning we can impose a basic certain core curriculum, and this still stands under our side of the house. Now, second of all, they gave us a sort of vault attack, meaning that the vault chart in itself is not enough. Now, they gave us several examples to this, one being, for example, Arizona. Now, first of all, we're talking about our model, right? Now, our model, we stated that these vouchers are actually enough for it every private institution, meaning we can also adapt the amount of the voucher um, if it is necessary to actually get into these private schools. And second of all, we're talking about this on a principal level, right? We're talking about the idea of a voucher system. The idea of a voucher system is actually a good thing, right? We're not talking about in single cases because it might have like been successful because there's also cases on our side in which it actually was successful and which it actually worked. We're talking about the general idea of whether the voucher system is a good thing and this is something that we outside proposition believe still stands. No thank you. And second of all, we don't want to clarify that we don't <coughs> want private schools to cost more than the vouchers themselves, right? This is also something that our first speaker gave up. You're right. Inner framing in itself, no thank you, which could stand as a point. So coming to the attack on our side. Now, they first of all attack the accessibility, saying that not everyone actually has the ability to attain a certain voucher, and the middle class sonically kind of falls through. Now we said that first of all, due to our model, if you take on our model, which clearly states that everyone under a certain median gets a certain voucher, right? Meaning it is actually accessible for everyone that needs this voucher, we believe this still stands. And second of all, the middle class could also have the opportunity to go to private schools, right? They have the resources to actually go to these private schools. Do you know what Second of all, we'd like to clarify that we still put extra money into these curriculums, right? We still put extra money, for example, into schools that cater to people with disabilities. No, thank you. Now, third of all, he kind of attacked the point on it fights against racism. That we have to, like, but, yeah, exactly, that it fights against racism, and this simply does and somehow not work. Yet, ladies and gentlemen, we've clarified to you throughout our first speech that we let people into the schools that they could otherwise not go into, right? We let 
people from different income classes go into schools that they would otherwise not let, like, be able to go. And we believe that the people within these private schools themselves actually see these people and actually get to know these people. And this actually, in the end, fights against the prejudices they have against these people, right? It fights against the perceived things they have with these people. And we believe this, in the end, actually fights against a certain amount of racism that we see within society itself. Now, coming to my own rebuttal. Now, here are two major points. No, thank you. First of all, the point on the accessibility. I mean that not everyone actually gets a voucher and there's not enough money. Now, first of all, I've negated this within my reconstruction itself, as we're looking at a model in which the idea of a voucher system is relevant, not whether it's actually um, yeah. no thank you, and certain examples did not work. And second of all, they said that they want to put all this money that they have through the voucher system into the public schools. Now, we have one problem with this, that we already put a lot of money within those public schools, right? And these public schools are in somehow, in some way, not really um, getting better, right? There we have deteriorating public schools that cannot actually give a certain quality of education to the students themselves, right? We do not have, we already have like enough money, we already have, the state already puts a lot of money within this space, and we believe this money could actually be used in a more sensible way by using this within the vouchers, within where we can actually guarantee the students to get a better education, yeah. right? No thank you. And second of all, he said, he gave a point about private institutions, about how there's no regulations within the curriculum itself. Now, I've already negated this within my reconstruction, but again, let's say there's no reg that they, there are regulations because the state actually has a certain say in where the money goes, and the state can actually enforce a certain curriculum that in the end has a certain. However, we do not believe that there's regulations within the way that people should be teached. They gave us no concrete harms on their side. And we, on the comparative, still have our benefits standing, right? We still have the benefits of these students having been catered to their specific needs, standing on our side of proposition, which is why, on this side, to this point, we win this debate. Now, coming to my own substantive speech about the increase of quality of education due to competition. But first of all, you seem to disagree. If the state has a certain amount of budget for education, how are they going to get more money for vouchers on your side of the house if the there's is, no money? The thing is, they're going to use this money that they put into education and use it as vouchers, right? They're going to take this money and then put it into the vouchers. And so, like, every student, in a way, has a voucher for a certain amount of money. The idea is, if these students then go to schools, they then give the schools money, right? The amount of students is actually relevant within the amount of money that they get. <coughs> Meaning if the students have a certain amount of like voucher system money, then they go to these schools and the school gets the voucher money that these students have. So under this side, like this is how we propose our model under our first speech. Now coming to my own substantive. Now, why is there no competition in status quo? The state holds a monopoly over public schools by controlling them, right? So there's a, certain, a significant amount of students who don't have other possibilities than the public schools themselves. Why are these monopolies bad? Three layers. First of all, there's a lack of incentive to change. Why is this the case? Because first of all, there's only one supplier on the market, and there's little incentive to innovate as it threatens um, them losing their customers. And second of all, there's a lack of allocation of resources. Where can we see this within the schools? The public schools have, for example, no heating or no cooling. They have chemistry labs with inadequate security. We see it within the equipment, the teachers, the general well-being of the students themselves, as well as the attitude and the learning atmosphere of the teachers within the schools. Now, the impact of these monopolies themselves is that, first of all, there's a low educational quality within the public schools. Second of all, there's little chance for improvement of the people who can actually not afford these private schools. And third of all, there's less economic development as there's less qualified workers within the economy itself. The second layer of why this is actually bad is the political biases, right? So we have politicians that don't necessarily make the most economically logical decisions, but rather those that have the biggest political benefit for them. This opinion does not represent the interests of the entire population, like the market does, due to higher participation or voters within strange states. This does not represent the interests of those that are most affected by the policy, as the students cannot vote, and that teachers have the lowest turnout among these groups. Now, it's different under our model, as we have private institutions that pay more attention to these, right? Because these are their customers. Third layer is the inflexibility. The government policies take a long time to go from draft to implementation, and the market can actually react to problems and changes faster, within days or even weeks. Um, the impact of this being is that the market is more flexible and therefore can cater to the interests of the people more. Why is the competition created through our model beneficial? Because the students themselves and their parents are the most relevant actor and are given the most power and attention. They, can, they are the ones who decide which school they go to. They are the ones on the side which school in the end actually gets money. And thus schools have to be more attractive to attract the students. The effect of this is, is first of all, a higher quality of education as there's the actual incentive to develop, as the incentive to actually earn money through this development, right? Because good quality is attractive. And second of all, diversification. I mean, there's more individual offers as to actually set them apart from other schools and make them more attractive to specific types of people. The overall impact of this being that there's better quality of education, which is good for the students, obviously, 
because they have a better chance in the job world, development of individual character, as well as a certain happiness of being able to attain um, education in the right, proper way. Second of all, for society, because it benefits the economy and there's a diversification. So because we can batch for a better future, please, please do post. Thank you for your attention. The start of proposition already lost their main point in this debate, accessibility. When they tell you that public schools are so very bad and private schools are so very good, but never prove to you how everybody will they'll be able to go to private schools if they're the only and best option. And we tell you that even if we accept all of their models and all of their explanations, there are still people left hanging in this so bad public system. And we believe that if they don't prove it throughout the debate and they have one more speech left, we believe they, that they lose. Now, I want you to remember our metrics. Firstly, accessibility that I'm going to talk about. Secondly, quality that I'm also going to talk about in, 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 in in my rebuttal, and thirdly, about justification of spending private uh, public money. We believe that justification for sp spending public money is ex extremely important principle that I'm going to talk about in my third substantive point. But before that, a bit of rebuttal, firstly, about their model. Now, there's two issues that we tackled on, on their model, is firstly, about the price. Now, uh, what they tell you that the price of the um, vouchers is going to be the same as the price of the uh, private schools. What we believe that if the state has so much money left off, we believe that that money should be funded into uh, public education. But what we tell you is that this never happens in the real uh, in real yeah. life because states don't have enough money to fundle into these voucher systems. We tell you that they fund too little, uh, too little to these kids, so we have people who still have to pay uh, extra money to get into public yeah. schools. Actually, so we believe that, they, that this doesn't work in the real world. Secondly, about curriculums. When they tell you that we still have the basic curricula curriculum uh, hanging on, we tell you, okay, this is true. But if you tell us that um, that the states are going to regulate these uh, these schools, we believe that there is no leverage for these schools to actually do what the side of proposition is proposing, to get some specialized sort of programs for kids. We tell you if the state wants to, uh, wants to regulate these schools, this will never be possible. So this entire point falls because of their model. Now, secondly, about accessibility. Here we, here we have two issues. Firstly, about what I already said, that not everybody can go. Because as Marco already said in his speech, we, all, we have this um, middle class still left standing that has to go to these public schools that are still so bad. And we tell you that even if we accept that these public schools are bad, they're going to get even worse for these kids because more money is funded into vouchers. And we believe that we're losing money to actually fund for these kids that are left over. And we believe that we have to take care of everybody in this debate. Now, secondly, about the race issue. What the side proposition never actually tackled is the structural racism, where we say the problem is the society. So even if these kids go to some sort of private schools, they're still going to be treated the same. But even furtherly, if we allow these private schools to open, in the ghettos and in the poor neighborhoods, they're still going to be bad and as bad as the pu public schools are in these neighborhoods. Because the issue is that these schools know Ma. that people don't have enough money to pay for these private schools, so they're not going to be as high quality because they have to ex be accessible to these people in these neighborhoods. We believe that this doesn't change on the side of proposition. We will only change this if we equal out the public schools everywhere. Now moving on to the point of about quality. First question that we have for quality for the side of proposition is, what is your guarantee that you're actually going to get quality under your, your model? We believe that leaving education to the free market is something extremely dangerous, and there is no guarantee to actually achieve quality under your side of the house. But furtherly, we tell you that not, not all, uh, when they tell you the public, public education is very bad, we have the issue that not all countries have bad public education. They give you the example of the United States, for example, but this is very specific. They have this, this, this specific issue that is not the case in other countries, and we believe that the wrong investment in these schools is the problem, which we can change within the state, not with voucher systems. Now, we tell you that long term, when the state is investing in a better public schools, we get, we're, we're going to be better off because of this investment, but also what we tell you, as I already said, is that we're um, uh, not only putting um, education, and which is so very important for everybody, to the free will of the free, uh, free market, which we believe is dangerous, but also we uh, have less funding for public schools, but at the end, uh, we still uh, have to think about, even if we accept that quality exists, and even if there's substantive stance, we still only get it for a small amount of people. This is extremely problematic. Now, on to the point about politicians, how they're going to put less, they have the incentive to put less money into these schools. Now, this is very interesting because we still have these same politicians in the side of propositions, which means that if they put less money into school, that means that there, that there is going to be less money for vouchers as well. So we have the same problem on the side of proposition. And we believe that what is even more problematic uh, is that if the voucher amount was to get smaller, this would mean that not only the private schools, uh, the private schools would, would not change prices, and it will be even worse for these kids which, which cannot pay. Um, now moving on to our first the third substantive about public money. Now this is extremely important and I want you to listen up. That with public money, we 
people are paying taxes, which means that they're diverting their own hard work, their own extra money to give to the state, we, and they, they expect something in return. Now, when the state is spending this money, they have to respect three principles. I want you to write this down because it's firstly, they have to provide benefits for everybody in the society. They have to benefit the people, not the private entities. Secondly, this money cannot be used in a discriminatory way. And thirdly, it has to respect the secularism of the state. Now, how do vouchers undermine all three of these principles? Firstly, why is the problem of investing in private entities? Money from the hardworking people is going into the hands of uh, private businessmen, which means that uh, this money, which should be invested, invested in teachers, in curriculum, just a second, in programs, is instead being invested in marketing, PR, and in the end, the extra money is going into the pockets of the uh, private owners. Yes, please. The fact is we're giving people the money more directly because we're giving them the voucher vouchers, which they can then decide okay, by Okay, thank you. If you don't assure that everybody is going to get something back from these vouchers, we believe that this doesn't stand on their side of the house. Now, we, we have the example of all profit or in, on average for-profit schools spend 27% of their money to marketing while non-profit schools spend only 5% of their money to marketing. We believe that this is the money that is going to something that is never going to be give back to the people. We believe that public money should go, come back to fulfill people's needs but instead this money is not going to be accessible and, uh, for everybody on the side of the uh, proposition. Now secondly, private schools are a fertile ground for discrimination. We have segregation by voucher schools which can pick and choose students as they please. We have the um, uh, the, the research of uh, the University of Kentucky who tracked Milwaukee voucher system and found that voucher schools do tend to uh, take students that suit their needs that they want to take. We believe that this is extremely discriminatory, especially for people who are of different races and, um, and religion. And we can see this at the example of US where we have all Christian or all uh, black schools, which we believe that is extremely uh, problematic because putting aside the debate of whether these schools are good educationally, it's problematic if only they're accessible only to some based on religion and based on race. We can see this at the example of Ohio in which more than 90% of voucher schools are Christian schools, which means that only Christian people will be available to go to these schools. Now, on the side of opposition, public investment includes everybody, which is why we see them as a, a proper sort of investment. Now, thirdly, about religious schools specifically. It, this is very relevant because 90%, as I already said, money used for vouchers goes to uh, religious schools. We have two main issues with putting money into religious schools. Firstly, is the uh, this idea of secularism, because states that work worship secularism, now put their money directly into religious institutions, we, f we find this very problematic. Secondly, it's about the curric curriculum itself. We see sending money to, money to religious institutions, which would uh, choose not to teach based on their um, uh, based on science, but or rather to based on their beliefs. We believe that this is extremely uh, uh, problematic because they will, for example, not uh, choose to teach uh, evolution and so on. It's completely unjustifiable to send public money in schools that do not give proper education, but only based on their beliefs. Now, when it comes to education, public schools are justified because they allow an opportunity to all taxpayers to give their children education. Giving vouchers, the state will invent, invest a large portion of money to the private sector, which are private schools. Now, with that, usage of private money does not benefit the public completely, is used in a discriminatory way, and does not respect secularity. The state, this way, undermines the duty towards the taxpayers. We believe that this is not justifiable. So, uh, only based on this principle, you should uh, judge side off. The opposition loses this debate at the point where they focus on people still not being able to get to private schools. Why? Because at the point where we can prove to you that there's more people who have the accessibility of a better education, and not just everybody, we already win this debate because of that opposition's choice of making this the most important part of their case. Now, three clashes in my speech. First of all, principle, secondly, accessibility and equality, and third of all, quality of education. Now, first of all, to the principle. We bring in our first speech the principle of choice, where this is, in general, a good thing and makes your education more legitimate in the first place, which we don't hear any response to whatsoever from side opposition. Second point of principle is legitimacy of funding, which both sides actually had something to say about. Team opposition comes up and tell us, tells us, well, since we have no control of what's going to happen, since we're not actually giving the money back to the people, it is not legitimate for the government to fund these private institutions. Now, first of all, we need to look at the status quo, as our first speaker also already did in her speech, being that in the status quo, these private schools are to some extent, actually very often to a very huge extent, already also funded by the government because education is such an important <coughs> thing. Now, if we see that this funding already takes place, but not everybody has accessibility to that, we see that there we have an actual problem. We see funding for these schools happens on both sides of the house. 
only on our side of the house it is legitimate because we do give people something back. Now, how does this work? Because the side opposition claims that these schools are generally just going to spend their money on other things than the education. Well, the point is that these schools need their, 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 need their children to actually attend these schools for their survival, meaning that they actually need to give them a certain amount of education because otherwise people will just not choose to go to that specific school, which is why we believe this is the most, uh, this is the best mechanism of ensuring how exactly we're going to give this money no. to the people because they then can then decide which education they're going to spend it on, right? This is why we believe this is legitimately Certainly a point that goes to our side of the house. Now, secondly, about accessibility and equality. We have several problems here. First of all, team opposition says, yeah. like, um, no, thank you, we, where are we going to get that money? How much money are we actually going to have? First of all, we have explained that to you in our model, right? Which team opposition has completely ignored. What we would like to see is a model in which we having um, this money going to those people who actually need it, those people who can't afford private schools in the status quo, and then we do not want private schools to charge higher fees than can be paid with that voucher, right? So thank you. Now we say that even if said opposition actually succeeds in telling us that this is somehow not possible, which they never do, there is no mechanism whatsoever on their side how this is not going to work, except that like there's just not that much money, well then we're just not going to have like that expensive private schools, right? Where's the harm in that? Now, even if we say that that is actually the case, we still see that there are a hell lot of private schools that actually are accessible with these vouchers. Why? Because that is something that people have an incentive to build up, right? Because that is something that they can get money with, that a huge uh, amount of people are actually searching for, which is why we believe this is certainly something that is going to exist. No, thank you. Secondly, they tell us that like these schools are just not financially stable and therefore like people who try to get their education at a private school will actually end up with no education whatsoever. Now, two problems with that. First of all, this is certainly not going to be the majority of cases because people do inform themselves because people do ask other people who have went to that school before in um, when they're making their decision about which school they're going to send their children to. This means that the most schools that are actually financially unstable are at the like in the worst case scenario only existing for one or two years and then there's like a very minimal harm to what that opposition claims yeah, that to be. No, thank you. But secondly we have to compare this to the status quo, right? Where people go to public schools that have like far too many children to teach that cannot concentrate on the specific needs of these people where there is actually a lot of children coming out of the school please. not having Madam. had any benefit of that education. Yes, please. Can you show us one example in the state of school where vouchers work? Well, for example, those vouchers work in Sweden, but we do not see that that is actually something that we really should care about in today's debate because as we also said in our second speech, we do not want to, um, for, to like have this debate about single examples that do have um, happen in the status quo because we believe that there are certain flaws in uh, in current um, in current <coughs> systems that do not need to be there that are not inherent to school voucher system in general, which is why we believe that this is not relevant to today's debate because we are trying to tell you that in general this is something that in most cases when it is implemented not completely bad will actually help a huge amount of people. So this is what we're talking about in today's debate as we have already told you. Now. So, coming to the next point under accessibility that our side of the house brought to you, and that is that you really need these children to get more confidence in order to fulfill their potential, right? Also something that opposition has never ever responded to. The huge point that stands on our side of the house at this point in the debate, and will continue to stand um, until the end of the debate, is that there is a hell lot of people who just are not able to get the education that they need. Looking at public schools in the very big majority of countries in the status quo, we see that children are just like this, very huge classes, right? There is one teacher for yeah. something like um, 30 to sometimes 50 kids, which is just impossible to cater to every single one of their specific needs. We're going to have smaller classes by giving people like more different schools because there is an incentive for people to establish these no. schools because you can get money even if like, most people could otherwise not pay for that in the status quo. No, thank you. So we see that actually we solved like a very huge amount of problems that we're seeing in the status quo by giving people the possibility to have a more specific choice as to what exactly they are going to cater to. Now, why, does, why is it so important that that opposition has never tackled this point at all? Yeah. Even if we say that team opposition's points all stand that we're having minor harms for minor groups of people, for example, being people who still are not able to afford private schools, which is a far, uh, which is far less 
people than there is actually in the status quo, right? We see that even in that scenario, the huge benefit that we see to people who are actually able to choose the school that fits the best right now, to choose the school that they actually are going to take the education with them that they need for their later life, we win this debate, right? Because this is yeah. such a big group of people that we actually see that even if we say that there are harms in that opposition, this is not enough for them to win the debate. Now, Next point about accessibility and equality being racism, right? We see that we have brought you an analysis on our side of the house that has not quite been responded to by side opposition, how we're going to solve this. It is very simple, right? We're having different kinds of people going to the same school, getting, know, getting to know these people and actually like making friends with them and therefore like being less racist in their no later chance. life. Why? No thank you. Because these people are just going to choose their schools for other reasons than like which one is closest to them or which one their um, ethnicity is actually going to um, be uh, dominant on because they're just having these different possibilities, right? This is something that has not been tackled by said opposition at all, right? Because we do see that as they claim like they still have a choosing process, they have not, right? We tell you in our model that people do need to actually be allowed to get their education at these schools in the end, which is why we believe that that is actually a huge benefit for racism and the status quo that we get on our side. So the opposition just comes up and says, well, that is not enough. We have like other structural barriers, right? But if we say, if that's true, like, we still have one thing that we change, one benefit that we have, which is enough for this point to go to our side. Now, last point um, being the quality of the education. The big problem that said opposition has here is like, stuff like religious schools who are not going to teach what the government wants children to learn. First of all, we, say you, we tell you there are regulations as to the main curriculum, right? As to the very basis of what people really need to know. And everything that comes on top of that can be different to what like, most people need. That is the whole point, right? Everything that comes on top of that is supposed to be individual, right? So we say that the harm that they are telling us that some public schools are going to lose money is first of all no problem because there's less people that they have to cater to. And second of all, the big majority of people is actually going to have a huge benefit on our side of the house, which is why we win this debate. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Team Germany ironically coming from a country that is taking the fourth place due to the quality of public education throughout this entire debate gives you not one single example of where the voucher system succeeded. And no, it is not enough for them to just prove you the vague principle of how this could work somewhere and somehow. They have to show you practically how their system works and where their system worked for us to believe what they're saying. Three points in my speech. We started this debate taking three things that we have to do, and those are exactly the three clashes that happened in this debate. Accessibility, quality, and the justification of spending the public fund. First of all, about the accessibility. What we tell you from the entire, uh, through this entire debate, is that accessibility doesn't really happen, first of all, because only the few get the voucher, but also because vouchers are partial. Now, here are the examples. We tell you that it comes to so, uh, so banal examples where Louisiana had the system where they literally uh, give, gave vouchers on, based on the principle of lottery. Meaning that the right to education was given to someone based on whether they were pulled from a bowl. No, thank you, madam. This is not a system of accessibility that they're talking about. Secondly, we tell you that in Arizona, vouchers cost $4,040 compared to a $10,050 fee. In Georgia, what happens is the $5,060 voucher compared to the $10,600 fee. Those are not entire vouchers that they can just simply uh, like um, make bigger or uh, improve because they have a limited budget just like we do and that's what we're all aware in this debate. Now what we tell you is that accessibility is not when somebody has to pay the entire fee or even half of the fee, because what we, tell, what we ask them is how are the people below the poverty huh. rate, which are the group they're talking about, ever <coughs> going to be able to pay those $5,000? This is the question they have to prove if they want to talk about accessibility. This is not an accessible or a sustainable model on their side of the house, especially with no example throughout three speeches. 
But the issue that we're talking about is exactly the wrong distribution of money that happens on their side, where the state doesn't really know what to fund, so they fund the vouchers and they fund the public system and they fight this, this, uh, or everything pretty much. And what happens is that the state literally has no money to make anything high quality. They can't fund vouchers, they, they can't fund the public system. And on their side of the house, what happens is that so many people are left behind and they have to go to the underfunded public system, which is what they concede in the third speech. This is not the quality of education that they're talking about, neither the, uh, neither the accessibility. But on the second point under accessibility, where you talk about the racial bias, from the beginning we tell you that this is a structural thing, that the, the, that the racial bias does not simply just uh, not exist on their side when you have a private, uh, a private owner. Those people also are racially biased. Those people also have this, uh, the stereotypes that they're talking about. They're also going to not let people in. But what we tell you is that what also happens is the self-segregation. Uh, in our third substantive, we talk about religious schools. We talk about all black schools. The schools that really aren't no. that accepting as they're talking about. Now what happens there is exactly the issue of the choice that they talk about as the main point in their speech, where people no. literally choose to, to take the schools which aren't so accessible to everyone and go to only the, the schools of their religion or only the schools of their, uh, of their race. But also, we tell you, the choice is also not inherent, the, uh, not inherently an issue on our side. We tell you that in Europe, people literally can't choose which public school to go to, which is why we don't really think this is a, an issue in this debate. No. But what happens on our side of the house is that the state is held accountable to the public, and the state has to uh, give education to everyone on the same quality. And under our model, we're going to give this education to everyone because we're going to distribute all the money and all the funds for education to the public system, and we're going to make it accessible, and we're going to make it high quality for everyone, which is going to improve the uh, social mobility that we're both talking about in this debate. But when it comes to the second clash about the quality, the first issue we have on their side is that they literally talk about regulation of the market, which is where they even concede that we do need the state as a factor. So here comes like two clashes. Uh, two questions. If we need the state to regulate, then why just not let the state have the public system and do everything in high quality according to their wishes for everyone? Question they literally never answer. But secondly, we tell you that it's really not that easy to regulate the private sector. And we see this with many companies where you literally can do nothing to them because they're the ones who have the capital. Now, what they have to prove to you is that this regulation is in the first place going to be possible on their side, but also that it's so needed, which they never do throughout this debate. But now, to talk about the, uh, how, uh, the regulation that they talk about. The, the, the regulation that they talk about and that is happening <coughs> today is that 119 charter school closing every year. The regulation they talk about is those schools spending 27% Mom. of marketing. No, thank you, Meta. The regulation they talk about is the Harambe Institute that is turning into a nightclub when there's no kids in school. And the regulation that they're talking about is the Florida charter schools, which literally have no classrooms, which are their third substantive point. So what we're asking you today is how exactly are they going to achieve this quality and how are they going to refute those examples? Ma yes, madam. Are you saying that in the status quo, the public schools are actually having a lot better quality than what you're just talking about? Yes, madam. Because we give you examples and you give us none. We tell you that there are examples of the Scandinavian countries that have an amazing sustainable model of public education. You have Denmark, you have Finland, you have all those countries. You have literally Germany where you're from. Those countries are the countries where you have a sustainable and high quality public model accessible to every one of those citizens. And this is the model that we're talking about and the model that we're proposing in this debate. Now, this is why we tell you that the state accountability is so important and crucial because it's the only way that the state is actually going to have a curriculum for everyone, that the state is going to have high quality for everyone. And we tell you that if the state makes a mistake, the public is going to react to those mistakes. When the private owner makes a mistake, no one is going to react to those mistakes. What's going to happen is you're going to leave children with no education in the end. But when it comes to our third clash about the justification of uh, filling the private sector with public money, literally what they never, never refute, and it's a very, very important point on our side. We tell you that what happened in Careers Australia is that they gave 40 
million dollars to their private owner. This is not something that we stand for. We think that the public money that comes into education has to go back to the education, not just to some private owner. If we as the public do really invest in education and want our children to be educated high quality, we don't want just some guy who invested in a school to get all this money and buy a yacht. This is not what we stand for on our side of the house. But we also tell you that we, the city is not justified to uh, fund the schools such as religious schools that do not make it accessible for everyone and that do the, have the segregation that we talked about in our second class. And then could we show you that it's our side that gives you accessibility. It's our side that gives you quality because we're the only one who can really, really regulate and we're, that we're, it's not justified for them to fill the public money into the private sector. It's us who win this debate. Thank you. There is a certain amount of money that the state has to put into education. And this is what both sides of the house agree on. Side proposition never showed that the state doesn't have enough money to put into either private or voucher schools, so this stands. Now having this in mind, what side of opposition tells you, let's put all of this money, this big bunch of money that we agreed on we have, into public schools. Which means that public schools are gradually getting better over time, as we have seen in the examples of Finland, of the old northern countries, and Germany itself. We believe that this stands and that the quality over time grows in all areas of our countries. Now there's more and more quality and more and more uh, equal chances for everybody because quality grows everywhere. Which means that most of the people which are middle class people can go to these schools in whichever areas that, live, that they live. Poorest people can go to these schools because they also grow in these areas where poor, poor people live. Well, this also means that the poor black kid can also go into these schools because they grow everywhere equally. And fourthly, the rich kids can go either to uh, private or to public schools because they're at this point equally as good. We believe what we achieve is accessibility for everybody. Now, side of proposition tells you, let's put all of this money into vouchers, which means that public schools are getting better and better, there's more public schools, and everybody can go to public schools, but it also inherently means what the side of proposition never tackled, is that there is less money for public schools, which are getting worse and worse over time, and this is highly problematic. That means that the most of the people, which are the middle class, will have to go to this terrific and this, the, these horrible, bad uh, private public schools because they're getting worse over time because there is no money. So the most of the people will get worse, worse and worse over time inside proposition. And on the other hand, they still have the rich kids, which could on both sides of the house go to private, uh, private schools. They have the poorest kids, which are the minority, going to private schools. But can compare comparatively, the biggest bunch of people are worse off on their sides of the house. And we believe that. That's what the point that we ask, where is the accessibility? For whom is this, this accessibility? Where is this choice on the side of proposition that they're talking about? The only thing that they get is achieving better, uh, better education, so-called, for the minority of the students. But further on, we tell you, if, this is if we assume that this quality actually exists. We tell you that quality <coughs> in public and private schools does not exist. Because there is no regulation, as we have shown you on our explanation and examples on that, on that side of the house. We tell you that there is um, profit-driven uh, people who are going to follow more more money into marketing and PR and their own profit than they will into actually teaching kids. Now, not everybody can go on, the side of the house, on their side of the house, and there, that's a huge problem. But even further on, like, now let's put aside this accessibility, let's put aside the quality. Let's think about the entire society, which the side of proposition never, ever tackles. We can't put people's money, their own hardworking money, into something that is not going to be accessible for everybody. We have three principles, which we've shown that this, the side of proposition breaks, out of which they defended none. So we still have not putting in money into benefiting everybody, but money into something that is discriminatory and in the end putting money into something that doesn't respect secularism. We believe that this is highly problematic. But okay, everything can look good on paper, but can it actually work in real life? Side of proposition says no. We as side of opposition show you problems with uh, private education in the status quo. We show you problems with vouchers on examples and we show you good public education that exists right now. On which the side of proposition tells you, well, in real life, everything is a bit flawed, so we don't really have examples, but generally it will work. Okay, if it generally works, why is there not even one example of a, su a successful voucher, not even one example of a flawed public system? We believe that if they prove this, maybe their principles would stand. We tell you, without any examples, they're only talking into thin air, thin, thin, into thin air because nobody is actually going to believe this. Okay, you can explain it as a perfect picture, but if it doesn't work in real life, I'm sorry, you have to vote side off. Thank you very much. Up 
went into this debate with a mindset of how the debate should run, right? But they never really engaged with the actual debate that we on side proposition and the actual model that we on side proposition gave to them. Now, in my class speech, I'm going to do a few things. First of all, I'm going to take a look at like the clarification. What were the points of, um, yeah, what were the points that were not quite clear? Second of all, I'm going to take a look at the three, three questions I saw in this debate: which system is more accessible, and which is more justified, and in the end, who will benefit the most? Now, first of all, coming to the clarification itself. Now, they give us several examples of, for example, Scandinavian countries or Germany in which this works. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in Scandinavian countries, you mostly have a voucher system, and public schools still work, right, ladies and gentlemen? This is not a, an example that is actually under side opposition today. Second of all, Germany is not representative, right? Because it's a liberal democracy and it's a fairly rich country itself. Why is this important? Because the accountability doesn't work everywhere. We don't have that little political biases everywhere, right? Now, second of all, they have a big strategic flaw in only engaging with a very specific model of, of the few examples that they brought up, but not the general model, the model that we on side proposition actually proposed. So they never really engaged with the real debate that we on side proposition gave to them. Now, second, third of all, they have a strategic flaw in bringing completely new comp continent within their third speech, something that we cannot adequately reply to, something that we should not believe counts. Now, coming to the three points. First of all, accessibility. Now, this was the most <coughs> important point to opposition. Now, what opposition said was that it's not accessible for everyone, it's not everyone gets a voucher, right? And that the voucher money in itself is not enough, and that the middle class in itself falls through. What we outside proposition said is that, first of all, the model caters to those who need it the most, right? It caters to those who are under the median, who need this money the most, and have the most need for this money. And second of all, they also have the incentive to actually use this because they have the incentive to obtain a certain better education. And again, the second class, about how the voucher money is not enough. Side proposition said that the voucher money is exactly as much as the tuition fee, or the tuition fee is higher than, or the tuition fee is not higher than the vouchers can actually get. I mean, this point absolutely falls down. I mean, on side proposition, it stands that it actually is accessible to those, and actually gives those people that are trapped under a current system that we see in status quo, gives them the chance to actually break free, to actually get a better education, ladies and gentlemen. First, second of all, let's come to the justification. What we heard on opposition was that we cannot give money to private entities <coughs> as we don't control them. What we said was three things. First of all, this is the case inside a school. Second of all, we still have certain basic regulations. We still have a certain basic curriculum. We have free choice on how you actually choose to teach this curriculum, free choice on the small on the small points of this curriculum. And third of all, because we are giving things back, we give them choice, right? We give them a certain choice and we give them a certain competition. Now third of all, let's take a look at who in the end will actually benefit most. Now what we heard outside of opposition was to the students that there's no benefits to the students. There's simply no benefits under Prop's model. Now they gave us no real mechanisms to why this is the case. And we have actually shown you benefits, right? We've shown you the diversification. We've shown you that we cater to specific needs of the students themselves. We've shown you that we give these students, in the end, a better education, and we give them the choice to this better education. Second of all, they have the point on that schools will somehow not benefit as um, as these public schools are simply underfunded and they will simply have a problem with this. They never showed us the problem with this underfunding itself. And we said about the change in public schools, if there's <coughs> less students that actually go to these public schools, then they obviously don't need as much money, right? Because this is simply the way this works. These students still have these voucher systems, meaning these students actually still bring money into these private public schools, meaning that education within these public schools is actually, in a way, going to get better. Now what we gave you were the benefits for the schools themselves. I mean, the private schools in themselves stay the same, and the public schools problems actually get better because these public schools are now not overcrowded anymore, right? They're not, um, they're not overcrowded anymore. I mean, the middle class students that side opposition found so important don't suffer either because these public schools actually do give them a certain amount of education. I mean, that even if we accept in this debate that there's harms to a very, very few amount of people, we see it still see that in the greater amount of people, because we actually benefit more people because we give them the chance to a better education, we believe this debate should stand. Thank you for your attention.